Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all doing super, super well. Thank you guys so much for being here and for listening to today's case. We're going to be talking about what happened to 34-year-old Maria Belen. This case happened in Ecuador and was all over the headlines in the media due to the circumstances of her death. Maria walked into a police academy but never made it out alive. Yes, a police academy, a place filled with people who are supposed to serve and protect people. So many people heard Maria screaming and asking for help, but no one stepped in and saved her. It's honestly just too much. This is such a sad case and there's a lot of information to go over. So with that, let's jump right in and let's talk about what happened to Maria. Maria Belen was born on March 14, 1988 in Ecuador. She had a big, bright smile and just like beautiful, curly hair. Since she was young, she always had an interest in being a lawyer. She was very studious and just like very hardworking and she just had this incredible work ethic. With her great work ethic, she studied law and also did her master's in litigation at the Californian Western School of Law. She worked her way to being one of the most known and respected litigators in the city and she specialized in cases of essaying and and gender violence. She just wanted to help as many people as she could. Her neighbors say that she would sometimes offer them free legal advice and she also created this TikTok page offering legal advice and encouraging victims of abuse to speak up against their aggressors and she also used her platform to spread information about feminism. She honestly became a symbol for gender violence in her community in Ecuador and at the time of her death, Maria was working for a firm that consisted of six other women who focused on criminal matters. And these six women, along with Maria, were also very well respected. Now, being a big time name did bring on some enemies. Shortly before her death, Maria had won a very big case and she was actually receiving threats because of this. On her TikTok account, she made a post saying that if anything were to happen to her, blank and blank were responsible. So she was very aware of the enemies that she risked gaining by, you know, having this career, but she just absolutely loved helping people and, you know, these threats were weren't going to scare her off. Maria had developed an incredible work ethic, not only to provide for herself, but also because Maria had a 13-year-old son, who we will refer to as Mike, you know, for the sake of the video. Now, Mike was from a previous relationship, and Mike's father just, like, really wasn't present, so he was pretty much out of the picture. Due to that, it was basically just Maria providing for her son. Since Maria was very busy with work, her mom, Elizabeth, would often help her take care of Mike. So, yeah, there was a lot going on in Maria's life. You know, she was a single parent. She was very busy with like this important work. She was receiving threats. I mean, there was just like a lot going on. Her schedule began getting busier and busier and then her grandma actually had cancer so Maria started taking care of her grandma which of course must have been such a difficult thing to go through. So there was just a lot on Maria's plate but she was a fighter and she would do anything for the ones that she loved. She just had such an incredibly big heart and everyone just says that helping people made her her genuinely happy. Despite being so busy, she still made time for her love life. Maria began dating a man named Germán Fernando Caceres in 2015 when she requested a police officer to actually escort her to withdraw some money from the bank to take back to her mother's home. And again, the reason she requested an escort is because she was receiving threats, so she was honestly scared to be out and about by herself. So she requested this police escort and the policeman that showed up was Germán. They immediately hit it off and they actually exchanged phone numbers and then from there they just like started dating you know like they would go to the movies they would go to dinners he would always buy her flowers so Maria fell really in love with this guy they continued dating for years and in 2017 they actually got married and moved in together with Maria's son Mike so they were now a family now let's talk a little bit about who Herman was Herman was a 29 year old police lieutenant and he was also an instructor at a local police academy 
academy where he would train new cadets. Now, the police academy where Herman worked was actually the police academy where Maria was last seen at. So, let's talk about what happened. On September 10th, 2022, Herman had a guard shift that was supposed to begin at 7.30 p.m. However, at 3 p.m., he had a soccer match with his team composed of some fellow officers. Herman did not have authorization to leave the academy since he did have an upcoming shift. So, Herman had to figure out a way to like work around this and just like make it to the match. He was able to pull some strings and was eventually allowed to leave the academy for his game, but they literally told him, you know, as soon as the game ends, you have to come right back and, you know, get ready for your shift. So, Herman agreed to the plan and he left to go play in the match. What's crazy is that Herman didn't even end up playing because he was actually a sub for the team, so he did all of that for like no reason. Now, when the match was over, he was supposed to go back to the academy for his 7.30 p.m shift how he had agreed to. However, instead of going to get ready for work, he actually went to the apartment of one of his cadet students named Nadisha, which was just outside the police academy. Now, Nadisha was having a party and, you know, Herman decided to go there to drink, you know, relax, like mingle with people, which is definitely an interesting decision to make. I mean, drinking before your shift as a police guard is probably not the best thing to do. Anyways, at this party, Herman came into contact with a student of his named Jocelyn Sanchez. And it turns out that Herman and the student Jocelyn were having an affair. Yes, Herman is a married man and he was running around with one of his students. Now, we're going to get into the details about this alleged affair in a bit, but yeah, Herman is just not a good guy. Like, at the beginning of the relationship, he was always getting Maria flowers, he was taking her on dates, he was a father figure for her son, Mike. In fact, Mike even referred to Herman as his dad, so he seemed like a good guy, you know, on the surface, but, you know, deep down, he was actually a terrible person. So yeah, Herman is having an affair and he meets up with his mistress at this party. They begin talking and then he asks her if they could go back to his room at the police academy and, you know, have some romantic time together. And Jocelyn agreed to this plan. Hedeman got so carried away at this party that he actually missed his shift at work. He never made it, but no one actually reported his absence at the school or his absence at work. And we're not really sure why. He didn't drive back to the academy until four and a half hours after his shift was supposed to begin. So he got there at around 12 a.m. And based on the surveillance footage, you can tell that he was drunk. You know, he was driving his motorcycle and just before entering the academy gates, he actually crashed and fell off his motorcycle. He was literally almost run over by a car, but the car just like barely missed his head. I've seen a lot of people state that if the car had run over Herman and either injured him and sent him to the hospital or even killed him, then Maria would probably still be alive today. Again, this incident wasn't reported by anyone either. Even though this incident happened literally right outside the academy gate, so the guards that were, you know, up there saw this happen, but yet they didn't report it, and then the surveillance camera also caught this, so it's just crazy how he could show up drunk, you know, late to his shift, but like wasn't reprimanded for this. Herman managed to make his way to his living quarters at the academy, and then a few minutes later, Jocelyn arrived. You can see her getting dropped off in front of the academy gates, and then she starts making her way to Herman's room. She eventually meets up with him and while they're hanging out, he starts to get a handful of calls from his wife, Maria. Of course, he didn't want to answer the phone in front of his mistress, so he told Jocelyn to wait for him in the room next door while he spoke to his wife. What Herman didn't know is that Maria was on her way to see him in person. Normally, unauthorized people weren't allowed to go inside the academy, but since Maria was married to a lieutenant, she was let in. You can see her pulling up on the surveillance footage in her own car and being let through the gate. She goes to park her car and then begins making her way to Herman's room. When Maria arrived, she and Herman began arguing pretty intensely. People who were in other rooms said that they could hear sounds of beatings and shouts for Maria, but that all of a sudden it stopped, so people assumed that they had stopped fighting and fixed whatever issue they were having. This really shocked me because Maria was asking for help. She was literally shouting, auxilio, auxilio, which means help, help. Yet all of these witnesses who heard her shouting didn't do anything to help her. The next morning, Herman was seen leaving the academy and returning two times. Maria, on the other hand, was never seen leaving. No one had heard from her or seen her that entire morning. The following day on September 12, 2022, Herman called Maria's mom Elizabeth and told her that he was not able to get in contact with his wife and that he was worried about her. Elizabeth, of course, was freaking out. I mean, where was her 
daughter. Herman went to the offices of the National Directorate of Crimes Against Life, Violent Deaths, Disappearances, Extortion, and Kidnapping with Elizabeth and told officers, you know, what had happened. He said that he was with Maria at around 7 p.m. the night before at the academy, and then they both decided to leave the academy to go back to their house, but as they were driving home, they got into a fight. So he ended up pulling over, and then he claims that Maria just like stormed out of the car and said that she was going to take a taxi back home. And that was the last time that he had seen her. So the police were like, okay, this is super weird. Like, let's recreate this route that you guys did and see if we can find anything that can help us locate your wife. So police from the missing persons unit took Herman and they had him show them the exact route that he took and the exact spot where Maria got out of the car. However, the investigators began noticing something off about Herman. They were noticing some inconsistencies and, you know, contradictions to his story. At one point, Herman even jokingly told Elizabeth, like, hey, don't think I had anything to do with her disappearance. You know me. You know who I am. Which is such a weird thing to say. Like, I get that in disappearances, people mostly look at the spouse. But I feel like just saying that of like, hey, like, don't think I had anything to do with it. I think it's just like a very odd thing to say. And it definitely stuck out to Elizabeth. And it also stuck out to the missing persons unit. Without wasting any time, investigators arranged the search of the living quarters at the academy so that they could further investigate Maria's disappearance. They asked Herman, can we go search your place? And Herman agreed to it. Around midnight on Tuesday, September 13th, investigators searched Herman's room. They discovered a red stain on the mattress and right when they were discovering this, Herman said that he changed his mind and that he didn't actually authorize them to search his room unless they came back with a search warrant. Elizabeth was there. Like Maria's mom was watching this entire thing go down and she was like, huh? Like, why aren't you cooperating? Like, what's going on? And she tried to convince Herman to retract what he just said, but he was being very stubborn and he did not allow them to continue their search. So that was that. Later that day, Herman was supposed to go to work, but he actually never showed up to his shift. So at this point, police were starting to get very suspicious of him. I mean, at first he was acting, you know, very cooperative and like wanting to help them, but now he was literally telling them that they couldn't search his apartment after they found a red stain on his mattress. And on top of that, he was now MIA from work. Police started to get a weird feeling, so they started to look for him and thankfully they were able to find him and bring him down to the police station for further questioning. Investigators basically told Herman that he needed to stay there until they did like paperwork, you know, like filled out formalities and such while they went back to search his living quarters with their recently obtained search warrant. So Herman waited for like at least eight hours until he was finally released. Back at Herman's room, police did find another stain that appeared to be blood on the wall. They also found, you know, traces of semen. They found empty beer cans and they also found personal items belonging to Maria, such as her shoe and her wallet. On top of all of that, they also found evidence that someone attempted to clean the room. So with all of this, it was definitely adding to the investigator's idea that Herman was suspicious. But at the same time, unfortunately, it wasn't enough evidence to charge Herman with anything. So since they didn't have enough to charge him, they had to let him go. He walked out of the police station a free man. He met with his family who was waiting for him outside. He spoke with them briefly and then he hopped on his motorcycle and left. Police did request to have a cop car follow him, you know, just to make sure that he didn't disappear. But by the time that that request was approved and a cop cop car did go to follow him, Herman was nowhere to be found. Authorities went to his sister's apartment with a search warrant to look for him, but he wasn't there. The only thing left of him was his motorcycle. So at this point, Herman was on the run. While police tried to locate Herman, other officers and detectives did their best to continue on with the investigation. They ended up interviewing 24 people who were at the police academy the night Maria went missing, and this is when a lot of shocking information was revealed. One person came forward and said that that night, he saw Herman dragging something down the stairwell that was wrapped in a blanket. Another person said that they heard Maria screaming for her life and calling out for help, saying, help, I'm getting killed. This cadet did report it to their superior, but they were simply told to not get involved in the lieutenant's personal matters. Yeah, like... 
I'm telling you guys, when I was doing the research for this, I literally, I just could not believe it. Like, my jaw fell to the floor when I heard all of these witness statements, especially because this is literally a police academy. So these are people that want to be police officers, that want to protect people, that want to help the community, yet they're not going to get involved when someone is literally saying, help, I'm getting killed. It's just absolutely disappointing. Another witness said that Herman was asking around for flashlights and for scissors. Another one said that they saw Herman place a bundle wrapped in a blanket inside his wife's car that she arrived in. And then another person said that they could hear people being intimate at around 5 o'clock in the morning. Despite these people seeing all of these incredibly suspicious things, despite them hearing all of this, no one said anything, no one went to help, no one reported or just like stepped in to see, you know, what is going on here? Like, what is Herman doing? Why is he asking for scissors? What is he carrying in that blanket? I know it's hard to know when or not you should get into people's business, but again, if someone is screaming so loud and shouting for help, it's just really hard to justify why you wouldn't help. You don't even have to get involved. Like, if you don't want to put yourself in there, that's fine, but you could at least call the police and report it. So, with Herman missing and nowhere to be found, all of the findings in his living quarters and the statements from these witnesses, Herman was now the main and only suspect. On September 15th, 2022, authorities released an arrest warrant for Herman and an alert was released for the borders to keep him from escaping the country as well as released an award of 20,000 US dollars for any information leading to his arrest. That same day, activities at the police academy were suspended so investigators could search for Maria as well as for any clues. Just the next day, police had finally made an arrest, but it wasn't for Herman. They arrested 24-year-old Jocelyn Bill the student that Herman was having an alleged affair with. If you recall, Herman told Jocelyn to wait for him in the room next to his. Well, she told investigators that she was in the room next to Herman the night Maria went missing and that she did hear the screaming and the shouting and that she even saw Herman carrying something bulky wrapped in a blanket down the stairs of the building. Weirdly though, she ended up changing her story. She later said that she was very tired from working a long shift and that she was a little bit drunk from the party, so she fell asleep after Herman told her to wait in the other room and heard absolutely nothing and didn't see anything. So she told two different versions of what actually happened that night. Because her stories were so inconsistent and because, you know, if one version was true, it seemed like she heard this and like saw it happening, she was actually taken to preventative prison on September 17th, 2022 for the participation of Maria's involuntary disappearance. The judge who ordered her arrest said that there was indeed evidence of her participation, which we will get into a little bit later. Now, if you remember, there were other witnesses who came forward and said that they also heard exactly what Jocelyn told authorities. So how come she was the only one arrested? Granted, these 12 witnesses were suspended from the academy, but they were not arrested. So a lot of people were just wondering, you know, what's the difference? Like, why only Jocelyn? Well, Jocelyn ended up getting a lawyer and he was pretty much asking the same thing. Her lawyer, Gonzalo, said, quote, she knows, just as several lieutenants and cadets know, she heard the same thing several people heard. What I wonder is why they prosecute her and only her. Why are they being cruel by requesting preventative detention from a cadet that she knows exactly the same or who knows even less than other lieutenants and officers who were present that night? Which I also thought was a good question. You know, why was she the only one arrested? So we will get into the evidence found against her in a little bit, but after a couple of days, another person was also arrested for their involvement. Police arrested Alfonso Camacho and he was also a lieutenant. He said that he actually heard scuffs and noises from the room close to his and that's when he went to see what was going on. Now Herman had his door a little bit open so he quickly looked inside Herman's room and that's when he saw Maria's still body. Herman told him to quickly go away and to not get involved that this was a problem between husband and wife. So Alfonso left. Both Jocelyn and Alfonso did not report what they heard and much more importantly what they saw. Jocelyn literally saw him carrying something bulky wrapped in a blanket down the stairs and Alfonso literally saw Maria's still body. So it's just shocking to me that nobody reported anything. I understand you, they were maybe scared because I feel like there's so much corruption and there's so much like threats. And so I can imagine that they were probably scared to say anything, but it's still just very disappointing. So after suspending the 12 witnesses and arresting Jocelyn and Alfonso, the investigation continued. Maria's car that she arrived in to see Herman had a luminal test performed on it and it came back positive. 
A video surveillance was released and it captures Herman leaving in Maria's car, but it never captures Maria leaving. Also, her entrance to the police academy was registered, but there was no register of her exit, which is a mandatory protocol that the academy does. Registering everyone that enters and leaves is required, so if no one saw her leave, why didn't they report it? And also, where was she? Days passed and there was just absolutely no signs of Herman. Searches for Maria continued and surrounding hills and mountains and grass fields were searched, but there was just no sign of her. Elizabeth, her mom, said that she was literally searching everywhere. She was even searching in garbage cans and in dumpsters. A few days later, investigators did finally make a breakthrough. Authorities were still in possession of Herman's cell phone, which he actually left before escaping. So they decided to look at Herman's phone records and that's when police determined that he received a phone call at 9.49 p.m. the day Maria went missing. The location where the phone received this call led investigators to a new area. It was at a mountain called Casitagua, which I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Now, this mountain area was about 10 minutes from the school right behind it. So, the area was searched thoroughly, and on September 21st, there was a discovery. There was a black bag containing two blankets and a towel with blood stains. Unfortunately, upon further searching the surrounding area, investigators found Maria's body in a ditch with a bag over her head. When the news that Maria had been found after missing for 12 days came to light, hundreds of people gathered in the capital. Quito to demand justice and demand that Herman be found and held responsible for what he did. If authorities did not find Herman, he would just go to live his life as if nothing had happened and just not pay for what he did, which was such an incredibly cruel and evil thing. People were outraged that authorities had let their one and only suspect disappear. The day after her body was found on September 22nd, Maria's family held her funeral. So many people attended, her old classmates, her co-workers, former clients, friends, members of the community, feminist groups. I mean, so many people showed up to share their condolences and to show support to her family. A purple cloth was placed on her coffin, which represents the fight against femicides, and feminist groups pledged that they wouldn't stop fighting for justice. During this time, Maria's autopsy results came back, and it determined that she died of asphyxia. She was strangled to death. Maria had a fracture in her thyroid cartilage and also a hematoma near her right eye, as well as a hematoma under her skull that led to a brain hemorrhage. They also confirmed that Maria's death occurred inside the room of Herman's living quarters. So when Maria got there to talk to her husband, the argument ensued and then Maria was killed right there in that moment. So after this, authorities just felt the immense pressure to find Herman. And even though more than 28 people called in tips about his whereabouts, police still couldn't find and arrest him. While searches continued on September 22nd, the prosecutor's office announced that the International Commission will arrive on Monday from Colombia to assist the investigation. That same day, the United Nations Ecuador released a statement urging authorities to prioritize the protection of women and respond to the violence that they are subjected to with actual real actions, such as training, preventative protocols, etc. for public servants, and urge that there be enough resources for women's protection. It was just a shock to everyone that a police officer was most likely responsible for Maria's death inside a police training academy. Like, just think about that. That's actually insane. Everyone was just so frustrated. They felt so unsafe because, I mean, these people are supposed to protect and serve you, but they couldn't even protect, you know, the wife of one of them. So how can they protect others? The police academy tried to defend themselves by stating that Herman was an isolated case and that he passed all of his psychological exams before being admitted and that he didn't have a record. Now, that was true. But at the same time, people were not forgetting that so many officials and officers in training ignored Maria's cries for help. Just because Herman wasn't crazy and had no record didn't make the school any less responsible in the eyes of the public. On September 26, the former president of Ecuador, Guillermo Lasso, announced the police academy would be demolished once investigations were completed. He participated in the symbolic closure and said that they will determine, quote, clearly the name of the person responsible, his accomplices, 
and his cover-ups of the murder of Maria Belen Bernal. Guillermo said after it's demolished, it will be a new concept of a police academy, which is inspired by respect for women and woman ran. He also announced the dismissal of the 12 people who were initially suspended, as well as replaced the head of the academy with a woman. So at least that was done. Going back to Maria's family, Elizabeth was not giving up on being vocal about her daughter's death and even went to the National Assembly and urged them to keep following up with Maria's case and just talk to them about how authorities were handling it. She said, quote, how can I be sure that the state will tell me the truth about what exactly happened to my daughter? She just felt like maybe this would try to be like a cover up or maybe people would try to like get her to hush and like go away. She was just really worried about finding out the truth and she expressed how Maria was last seen inside a police academy where it's supposed to be safe and surrounded by people who are in training to protect people. But despite so many people hearing her, no one helped her while she screamed. In her eyes, the school and the state were just as responsible as the person who murdered Maria. Thankfully, Elizabeth's message got to them loud and clear and the assembly created a commission special for Maria's case to monitor the work of the authorities. Time went by and there was still no sign of Herman. Authorities just had no idea where he could possibly be. Colonel Juan Zapata said that the police force can't give up, that now more than ever they need to show that there are more good cops than bad ones and they need to continue seeking justice for Maria and they need to locate Herman. During a press conference on October 5th, 2022, police commander Fausto Salinas stated that Herman had fled to Colombia by land. So they now knew, you know, how he got away and where he was. They just needed to locate him in Colombia. Finally, after three months of him missing, police found him on December 30th, 2022. Herman fled Ecuador to a town in Colombia called Panomino. There were reports saying that he was working at a hostel's bar, but the hostel gave a statement saying that he did not work or have any relation to them. That the photos taken of him at his capture were simply taken in front of the hostel, but like they had no relation. So that was that. It turns out that this entire time, Herman was in Colombia. The president of Ecuador said that once Herman returned back to the country, all the weight of the law would be applied to him. On January 3rd, 2023, Herman was transported back to Ecuador to await the legal proceeding. Police were able to like follow his trail to see like what exactly happened the day he fled and they learned that he fled to Colombia on his motorcycle and then tried to leave Colombia to go to Venezuela and Panama but was unsuccessful. After his capture, Maria's mother Elizabeth gave a statement and said quote, let's hope he doesn't commit to or even escape again. Three months after her daughter's murder, Elizabeth was finally close to getting justice. So let's talk about the trial. During this time, Herman actually confessed. Before confessing, he actually apologized to Maria's family and he struggled to get his words out as he held back tears. He said that he never intended to kill Maria, but that he went too far and was only trying to control her since according to him, Maria was hitting him. So what exactly happened? Happened that night. Herman confessed that after his soccer game and after he went to the party, he went back to his room and was getting so many phone calls from Maria. And when he answered her, Maria got mad that he was drunk and decided to go see him in person. Upon arriving and meeting with Herman, Maria noticed that he had a hickey on his lower neck. And you know, of course, that indicated to Maria that her husband was cheating on her. They began arguing, and Herman admitted to her that yes, he was indeed cheating on her for the entire time that they were married. This, of course, made Maria extremely extremely angry. I mean, this would just hurt anybody. I can't imagine reacting calmly to this. Like, I'm sure I would have been arguing. I'm sure I would have been screaming, you know, maybe saying some mean things because that's terrible to find out that the entire time you've been married to this man, he has been cheating on you. So, of course, Maria was angry and they began to argue even more. Herman claims that at one point, she also hit him in his private area. He tried calming her down by putting her in a headlock and he began beating her. He then strangled her to stop her from screaming. Screaming. Then, because he was drunk, he claims that he fell asleep and that he left Maria's body there like nothing. He says that he doesn't remember how blood got onto the wall or he doesn't even remember how badly he beat Maria. When he later woke up after being so drunk out of his mind, he wrapped her body in a blanket, dragged her down four flights of stairs, and then put her body in the car that Maria had arrived in. He then left her body inside her own car for about 18 hours while he went to work and, you know, did his best to 
to clean the room up. You know, he got rid of the sheets. He got rid of the curtains. He got rid of towels. And then at around 7 p.m., he left the police academy and began driving to dig a ditch and hide her body. Herman claims that he had no help from anyone. So after doing all of this, the next day, he went back to work like normal and decided to call Maria's mom, Elizabeth, and, you know, kind of do his plan of like, oh my God, Maria's missing. Like, what's going on? I don't know where she is. And, you know, just pretend like he literally didn't just kill her the night before. So he calls Elizabeth and then, you know, the rest we already know. So after confessing to all of this, Herman stayed silent and he refused to answer any questions about it. I don't know how truthful his statement is and a lot of people have doubts with his statement about Maria hitting him, about how this was like an accident and how he was just trying to like, you know, control her because I feel like trying to control someone, you don't put them in a headlock and then begin to strangle them. Like he could have simply just walked away. He could have told her, you know, shh, like my, I'm at work. People can hear you. There was just many options that he had. He didn't need to, you know, put her in a headlock and then strangle her to get her to calm down. So that was basically Herman's version of the story. But there's a lot more of what actually happened that night that was soon discovered by investigators. I know it's a lot of information, but bear with me. So what Herman didn't know is that Maria actually began recording when Herman began getting very aggressive and angry towards her. So she started to secretly record this fight. In the recording, you could hear her trying to calm him down. And then you can also hear Herman telling her like, yeah, I was cheating on you for five years and, you know, making a fool out of you. And the Herman was just being so aggressive in this moment. In the audio, you can also hear like scuffs and movements. And then all of a sudden, you can hear the moment that she is trying to scream for help and how she says that her husband is strangling her and how each scream becomes weaker and weaker as he takes her life. It's absolutely horrifying to listen to. I only listened to it because I was doing the research for this case, but I honestly don't recommend that you guys go look for it and try to hear it because it's terrible. Like you can literally hear Maria take her last breath. So with this recording, it kind of contradicted Herman's version of him being the one that was trying to get her to calm down, of, of him being the calm one, of him being like the innocent one, because you can clearly hear Maria telling him like, stop, like you're hurting me. I'm not sure if police didn't discover this recording until until after the trial began or if they already had this information beforehand but that recording is honestly just so disturbing and it just really is scary to listen to the final moments of Maria's life and how scared she must have been on top of that she was literally screaming so loud in the audio and literally saying like auxilio auxilio but yet no one knocked on the door and was like hello is everything okay no one called the police no one did anything I know I've said this so many times but it's just absolutely disappointing so after the trial concluded. In the end, Herman was sentenced to 34 years and eight months in prison, and he also had to pay a fine of about $230,000. As for Jocelyn, because remember, Jocelyn and Alfonso are behind bars. Well, Jocelyn was still in preventative prison since September 17th, 2022, but she was actually released from the preventative prison on January 18th, 2023, after the audios from Maria's cell phone were released. Since in the audio, Jocelyn is not heard, her involvement in Maria's murder was ruled out. I mean, good news for Jocelyn, but not good news for Elizabeth. Elizabeth was mad because she knew that Jocelyn heard her daughter screaming for her life, but yet did nothing. Jocelyn later came out and did an interview to try to clear her name, and she said that she really didn't hear anything and initially said that she did because she was pressured by authorities to claim that she heard something. She said that if she really had heard Maria screaming, that she would have stepped in not as a police officer, but as a woman herself. She said that she only went to Herman's room that night because he was her superior and she felt obligated to, you know, be with him, but that she felt uncomfortable doing this, but again, just had to do what he said because he was, you know, her boss. She also addressed some audios that were illegally released by her ex-lawyer in which she confesses to having relations with Herman at around five o'clock in the morning after he had already murdered Maria. There were also some text messages released where she messaged Herman asking if everything was okay with his wife after he murdered her. Herman responded by saying yes and then he also asked her to erase the messages on her phone which she did and again her defense is saying that she only complied to his request because he was her superior and she was pressured into doing so. Jocelyn added that she just wants to move on from this and continue to live her 
life and she also offered her condolences to the Bernan family. Despite her claiming that she was pressured to do this, that she was forced to, you know, be in this affair with Herman, that she didn't hear anything, etc. The public was still not happy with her and she is honestly not seen as innocent in the eyes of the public and to this day continues to get a lot of hate. As for Alfonso, he was also let free because of Maria's audio that was released, indicating that Herman was the sole killer of Maria and the only person inside the room. Alfonso's defense team said that he did not participate by omission because he did go check on the sounds that he heard and even if he did go report that he saw Maria's still body, Maria would have already been dead by the time that someone could have helped her. So he was let free but he cannot leave the country and he also has to report every day to authorities. Now what he was trying to argue of being like, oh well like when I looked in the room Maria was already dead so what's the point? It's crazy because I'm like you so you should still report it like you never know what if she was just passed out what if she was just unconscious and you calling the police and reporting this and getting an ambulance maybe could have saved her life so i think him arguing and being like oh like it was too late is just wrong elizabeth is not happy with this so she says that she's gonna try to make an appeal so we will see what happens with that so as of now the only one responsible in the eyes of the law is herman elizabeth to this day however is still fighting for justice she argues that her daughter's killer had help from other other public servants to cover up his crime. An important discovery that supports her argument is that when Maria was found, she was missing for 12 days. You know, if for the past 12 days she was in that mountain, nature would have gone to her, but when she was found, she was not in a state of severe decomposition. It appeared as if she was left there right before she was found, which is not possible since Herman was already in Colombia, you know, hiding. So it seems like someone else left her body there, but who? A lot of people believe that Herman had had help from others in transporting the body as well as burying her. Elizabeth says that she will continue with appeals and being in the streets to continue being vocal about her daughter's death and just make sure that everyone involved is responsible. She said, quote, my daughter was killed inside the police academy. It wasn't on the street. Let's not forget that. It was at a police institution at the hands of a police officer who was on duty and in the midst of many police officers who later assured that they did not hear anything. But he death was very well known in Ecuador and people there were in a state of distress and in a state of fear knowing that their country's policemen were murderers and that some even participated by a mission. It was a scary thing to think about, you know, which led to many protests and marches of women fighting for protection and changes to the justice system that was supposed to protect them but failed to protect Maria, which I totally understand. Like, just imagine that, like, oh, lieutenant's wife was killed inside a police academy. How can you trust any of those officers to protect you and to keep the community safe. A year after Maria's death on September 11th, 2023, hundreds of women marched in the capital. They had signs that said things like, quote, the police didn't take care of me, my friends take care of me. And what does it take to be a policeman? To be a murderer by night and by day? We want to live. They also had signs that said, Yuna menos. In response to these marches, the president shares that they will create an increase in the budgets for shelters and care centers for victims along with other measures that will take action against gender-based crime. According to the Aldea Foundation, there were 206 instances of femicides from January to February in 2023 in Ecuador. The president of the foundation said that the weekend of Maria's death alone, four women were brutally murdered. One of them was a nurse who was R-worded, stabbed, and dismembered. She also emphasized that 2023 was the worst year for Ecuadorian women and that 50 percent of femicides were by their partners or ex-partners. The president also added, quote, it is a terrifying figure. We are facing a state that is unfazed by the violent deaths of women. Maria's death was just a tipping point for women and all the women who are out in the marches are so brave for speaking out against authorities and I truly admire them for fighting for justice and just being so vocal about Maria's death. Elizabeth said that Maria's son Mike is receiving psychological help and that he's just very sad about this, which of course I can't even imagine, especially because he would refer to Herman as his dad. So just like imagine, like you finally get like a father figure in your life, someone that you feel like you can trust, someone that you feel like you love and that they love you and your mom, and then he ends up killing your mom. It's just terrible. And Elizabeth says that Mike always asked her, you know, what actually happened and asked how they're going to live without Maria. She also added that his biological father, Maria's past partner, who was never present in his life, has now tried contacting them in terms 
terms of getting custody of Mike, but that Mike does not want to do that. So for now, he's going to be living with his grandparents. As for the home that Maria and Herman shared, Elizabeth says that the home could be seized since the mortgage Herman took out in his name cannot be paid for. And, you know, Mike risks being left without nothing. She says that Maria worked so hard to decorate this home and she did her best into making it a home for her son and for her husband and that now it could be gone. Elizabeth is working to try to figure it out, but... As of now, I wasn't able to find an update on that. Her son, Mike, doesn't really do like interviews or like any statements really speaking about what happened to his mom, but he did make a tweet saying, quote, if you think killing my mom is just another death, remember that they took my world away. Herman, I called you dad and you betrayed me. Now I understand why my mom was a father and a mother. It's just so incredibly sad. My heart just goes out to him and I just can't imagine, you know, he grew up without a dad. You know, him and his mom were so incredibly close and to no longer have her be a part of his life is terrible. Elizabeth just doesn't understand how it escalated to this point because, you know, from her eyes, their marriage seemed normal. She's like, I really didn't see any issues between them. So I don't know at what moment this monster just snatched her away from everyone. I'm just truly glad that Mike has the love and support from his grandmother and that he he is surrounded by people that care about him and that are there to, you know, help him get through this. Now, the crazy thing is that after all of this, people on social media were saying that they can tell that Herman regrets what he did and that he only acted that way because of the alcohol and that it was an error that he made that anyone could have made. That he wouldn't have actually killed his wife if he was sober. Which I'm just like, huh? Like, I've mentioned this before. If alcohol makes you kill someone, it's not the alcohol. Like, that's already in you. Like, there's no reason why you being drunk should should make you strangle someone to death and then bury their body. Of course, when Elizabeth saw this, she was completely outraged and she was like, what is going on? The fact that murdering a woman is now deemed to be like a mistake is crazy. And, you know, she's like, Herman is not a good person. He's not a hero. He's not someone that was, you know, wronged by the system. He's not someone that made a mistake. No, Herman was a police officer that killed his wife. It's just absolutely enraging to hear about the people who were defending Herman. And I just feel like it's very disrespectful to, Maria, to Elizabeth, to Mike, to you know everyone affected by this. Elizabeth has hope that maybe one day Herman will tell the truth about who helped him with the murder, but until then, she is going to do everything she can to get police to re-examine everything. She knows that he had help and she will not rest until everyone who helped Herman directly or by a mission is held responsible. And with that, that is a case of Maria Belen. It's such a difficult case to research and to talk about and there's actually so much information on this case. Like there are articles and articles and videos and documentaries and just so much stuff that you guys can watch to get more information about this. It's honestly very overwhelming and it's just really heartbreaking because Maria just wanted to help people. She wanted to defend women. She wanted to just make a positive impact in her community. But yet this horrible thing had to happen to her at the hands of her husband. Not even at the hands of the people that were like threatening her. Like this happened by her husband. Someone that she thought she could be safe with. Someone that she thought loved her and would protect her. I don't know. It's just incredibly sad. But I would love to know what you guys think about this case down below. I mean, what do you guys think about the people who have empathy? for Herman. I think that's absolutely insane. So definitely let me know your thoughts on this down below. I really appreciate you guys being here and for taking the time to listen to what happened to Maria. She was a beautiful woman, a daughter, a wife, a mother, and her essence will always stay alive. Thank you guys again so much for being here and I will see you all in the next video. Bye guys. Bye.